Good morning, everyone. Happy Mother's Day. And I hope you're going to have a, a great day. And welcome to our time of worship. And for those joining us on Facebook Live, hello to you. Happy Mother's Day. And we are glad that we can worship together. Yesterday, we had a great men's breakfast. We had a great work day. We got a lot accomplished. So thank you for all those that took part. It was just a great day. But now we're ready to worship. So let's stand together and we are going to sing and worship the Lord together this morning. Amen. We've got a new song for you guys this morning. Um, it's a song that we heard, and and I really liked it. I really thought it was a wonderful song. It's by Phil Wickham. It's called Great Things, and it focuses on praising all of the wondrous things that our God has done, how he's been so faithful, how he always is faithful, how he's always doing these amazing and great things for us throughout all of our days. And so this song is really just focusing on worshiping God for all of the wonderful things that he does. And I'm very excited to introduce it to you guys today.
interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I am constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, find my wandering heart to thee. Grown to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Grown to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Thank you, worship team. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, we've had opportunity to worship you in song this morning. Lord, now in the quietness of this room, we quiet our souls and our minds and our hearts before you. Lord, we acknowledge that you are our God. You are our Lord. You are our Savior and we worship you and you alone. Lord, we recommit our lives to you as we begin this day and this new week. Lord, we thank you for how you're working in our lives, in the life of our church. Lord, continue to do your great work through your Holy Spirit. Lord, strengthen us. Lord, make us healthy. Lord, we just ask your blessing upon us, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to dismiss children and young people off to their groups at this time. Have a good time in your groups this morning. So I had the pleasure this week of making the announcement that we are going to have a new pastoral intern beginning in September of this year. And uh, so I'd like to kind of introduce him in person this morning. You have seen him around here, and he's been up here and reading the scriptures over the last uh, number of months. But his name is Zeb Mims, and he's going to be coming up right now. And he is going to be our new pastoral intern starting in September. He is going to be a student at Grace Evangelical Seminary in Bangor. And he is going to be starting a three-year degree, a Master of Divinity, MDiv. And I'll have the privilege of being his mentor for uh, these coming years. So we're going to give Zeb as many opportunities to do ministry as possible. We'll give him um, different areas to explore, see what areas of ministry he might really have passion for, a passion for and uh, so forth, uh, discipleship opportunities and all those types of things, please add him to your prayer list, and even now, and uh, as he has just graduated yesterday from UMaine uh, with a degree in history, so congratulations on that. So Zeb is going to come and read scripture for us this morning, but could you just share with us maybe two or three hobbies that you have? I know we know history, but besides history, what hobbies, just so we can get to know you a little bit better. So come and then read the scriptures for us. Thank you, Zeb. Good morning, everyone. Oh, make sure you guys can hear me. Um, so as far as hobbies, I'm a very outdoor person. I like to be outdoors. I actually don't like to be inside. Um, so this past winter was kind of hard. You know, uh, gyms are closed. You can't really do a whole lot as far as gatherings because of COVID. Um, and... Let's see, I'm not really much into video games, and a lot of folks my age are, but I hardly played them, so I, I tend to not do video games. Um, and what else? I'm trying to think, because I have quite a few hobbies. Um, I play a little bit of disc golf, um, <laughs> uh, not a whole lot, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Um, and this morning I'm going to read 2 Timothy, and let me flip to it in my Bible. I had it saved. 2 Timothy, um, chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. And um, I'll give you guys a second to get there. 
Um, so I'll start reading now. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, and Jesus Christ our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve, as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with, your, with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which was first lived in your grandmother, Lois, Lewis, sorry, and your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded, now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on, my, on, on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power to love and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. His grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause of shame, because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. All right. Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you, Zeb. So today is Mother's Day, and I've decided that I wanted to do a special Mother's Day message today, so that's what we're going to do. And before we go and look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 a little bit more closely, I want to share, this is written from, by a young mother probably 20 years ago, and things mom need most. So this is especially for young mothers, but for all mothers and even though this was written 20 years ago, from a number of you, even this past year, I have heard these exact same things. So number one, to know that I am normal. Number two, to know that I am a good mother. Number three, acceptance. Number four, encouragement. Number five, support. Number six, time with my husband. Number seven, time alone. Number eight, time with God patience, more energy, a break to get away, a nap, an adult conversation, a best friend, someone to understand how I feel, a dishwasher that loads itself. That's a good one. And then finally, to know that being a mother is important. To know that being a mother is important. Being a mother is very, very important important, and we would all agree with that. Now today, this morning, I would like us to focus on the most important thing that any mother can do as a Christian mother, and it is to leave a legacy to your children, to your grandchildren and to your great-grandchildren. Now, I'm not talking about money or fortune or fame or anything like that, but what is a mother's legacy? And we'll put it on the screen. A mother's legacy is to pass on to future generations a living hope in Jesus Christ. A mother's legacy is to pass on to future generations, her children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, those beyond, a living faith in Jesus Christ. Now, what is a living faith? If your Bibles are still open to 1 Timothy chapter 1, if they're not, if you would, I would invite you to turn to that section of Scripture. And I want to focus in on verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. 
the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, and Timothy is probably about 35 years old at this time. And he's writing this letter. Paul is at the end of his life. He's in prison in Rome. And Paul writes this. He says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and now in, in your mother Eunice, and I am now persuaded or convinced now lives in you also. So three things I want to share today, and the first one is this, that this living faith is a real faith. It's a real faith. Again, in verse 5, uh, in the NIV, it says a sincere faith or a genuine faith. It is a real faith. It is the real thing. It is the real thing. And so Timothy, his mother Eunice, and his grandmother Lois had this sincere and genuine real faith. But real faith in what? Let's go back to verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. And so for Timothy and Eunice and Lois, they had this faith in the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. This promise of life. Now what is that all about? So this week I have been reading in the book of Genesis, and I would ask you to turn to Genesis chapter 1, the very first book of the Bible. And we're familiar with the story of the first man and woman created. God created the heavens and the earth, and it was all good. God created the first man, and then he created all of the animal kingdom. And God said to the man, you're to manage this, you're in charge of all of my creation. And the first man went and he began to name all of the animals. And he was looking for a partner, someone that would be suitable, that would be a perfect fit for him. But this man could not find such a person. And so God said it's not good for a man to be alone. And put the first man into a deep sleep, you know the story. And out of his side, sometimes we say ribs, but out of his side created the first female. And let's uh, turn to Genesis chapter 2. And I love what it says in, in Genesis chapter 2 in verse 23. Now in the, our English Bibles, it really doesn't compare it to what the Hebrew language really says. And I remember many years ago in seminary in my Hebrews language class, this is probably the only thing I remember from that class, is the translation of verse 23. Now in the English, in our English Bibles, it says the man said, uh, but in the Hebrew, it really says, wow, uh, this is the one I've been looking for. Or it would really be, I mean, it's something of really excitement. It's like, woohoo! I finally found the person I've been looking for. And that's what this first man says of this first woman. And this is now bones of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, for she has been taken out of man. Now, some period of time goes by. We do not know if it is days or weeks or months. It could be even maybe years, but certainly not longer than that, that the first man and the first woman lived in paradise paradise in the Garden of Eden, and everything was amazing, and it was great. But then we know the rest of the story, don't we? That the serpent entered into the Garden of Eden, the devil himself, and first tempted Eve, and Eve rebelled against God, and then the man as well. And then as we come to Genesis chapter 3, God shares with the serpent and with the woman and with the man the consequences of the judgment of what life now will be like. 
And I've always looked at Genesis chapter 3 at, in, a, in a negative way, in a sad way, of all of what was lost. And that is certainly true. But this week, as I've been reading through chapters 1 and 2 and 3, I've looked at it in a whole new light, and especially Genesis chapter 3. That Genesis chapter 3 is actually a chapter about hope and the promise of life. So let's first of all look at Genesis chapter 3 in verse 16. And the Lord speak, spoke to the woman. And it says, to the woman, he said, I will make your pains and childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Now, I, I've always focused on the negative part of that. It's like, oh my goodness, this is like so sad that in this childbearing, there's going to be so much pain and it's going to be such a difficult thing. But I don't think that's how Adam and Eve looked at it. They looked at it as hope and a promise of life. Because what could God have said, had said in this situation? He could have said, and if I was God, this is what I would have said. Because of your sin and your rebellion, you're not going to have any children. There's not going to be any reproduction of the human race. The human race is going to end. Man and woman, once you die and you leave the scene, human race is done. And to be honest with you, if I was God, and thank goodness I'm not God, I think I probably would have gone to plan B. And my plan B would be, look, let's just focus on puppies and kittens. Puppies and kittens, that, that would be a much better plan. But that was not the Lord's plan. He stuck with plan A. And he said, there will be children. And there will be reproduction. And the human race will continue on. And so there's a promise of life. But let's go back to verse 15, just one verse up. Because there's also a second promise of life. So let's read Verse 15. Now this is the time when the, the Lord is speaking to the serpent, to the devil. He says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's speaking to the serpent. And between your offspring and her offspring. He will crush your head and you as, he, as you strike his heel. Now Judaism and Christianity for thousands of years they have taken this verse 15 as a verse of hope and a promise of life. A life that would be, a life that's, that's restored after the serpent is, is dealt with. So this is the promise of spiritual life, of eternal life. And so there is this great promise, this great hope that one day, one of the offspring from this woman will go and kill, destroy the serpent. And that life as it was intended to be from the beginning would be restored. And so in verse 20 of chapter 3, let's go down to verse 20. Now, I had never really thought of this verse in the context of what I just said. In verse 20, it says, Adam named his wife Eve, or Eva, because she would become the mother of all the living. When Adam first saw this new creation in chapter 2, he just called her woman. You have been for, formed out of man. But it's not here until chapter 3. After the fall, after sin has entered into the world, that Adam actually says, your name is going to be Eve. You are of the living. You are life. That's what Eve means. It means life. It means living. And so as we come back to Second. Timothy chapter 1 in verse 1, Paul here is talking about, he says, I am of this one of, uh, I'm sharing of this one of the promise of 
life or the life of promise that is in Christ Jesus. And so as we go back to verse 5, he says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, of your real faith in this promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. Not of physical life because the word that Paul uses for life is Zoe. It is of this eternal life. He says, you have this real, sincere, genuine faith in the promise of eternal life that is in Jesus Christ. So that is what these two mothers, this grandmother, had this real faith in the promise of this eternal life in Christ. In verse 5, again, it says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother and in your mother, and I am persuaded, I'm convinced, now lives in you as well. Let's put on the screen Acts chapter 16, verse 1. Now, let me just give you a little bit of context before we read this verse. In Acts chapter 16, this is the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. Two years previously, previous to this, Paul had come to Lystra, and he had shared about Jesus Christ. And it seems that Lois, the grandmother, on that occasion heard Paul and accepted Jesus Christ, she had this personal, real faith in Jesus. So now two years later, Paul has come back for a follow-up visit. So let's read Acts 16.1. Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek, and most likely he was not a believer. So two years later, Paul comes back to Lystra, and Lois, the grandmother, has shared with her daughter Eunice about Jesus, and Eunice has shared with Timothy in this period of time, and Acts 16 tells us that Timothy is now a disciple of Jesus as well, and that Eunice is a believer in the Lord Jesus. Now this word believer comes from the word believe, of course, right? But the word believe is an old, old, old English word, and let's put it on the screen. It means by live. So Paul says Lois and Eunice and now Timothy is not just believing in some kind of facts, not just believing in some kind of information, but we know that they actually believe, and they're actually believers in Christ by how they live. See, that's the real definition of a believer, of one that believes, this real faith. It's not just that they believe in some words, they actually live it out, they demonstrate that it's actually real. So here's the takeaway, we'll put it on the screen. You cannot expect your faith to live beyond you unless your faith first lives within you. You cannot expect your faith to live beyond you unless your faith first lives within you. You can't pass on to something you don't have. You can't pass on something you don't have. And so let me kind of pause for a moment in the middle of the sermon and ask you this question. Whether you are a mother or a grandmother or a father or a grandfather or anybody for that matter, do you have a living faith, a sincere, genuine, real relationship with Jesus Christ that produces this promise of eternal life. Do you have that? Because if you don't, then you're not going to be able to pass it on or to leave it with future generations. Now secondly, and we're still in verse five here, we see a real faith, but it's also a passionate faith. Because as I've just described, 
for you that Lois and Eunice, they go and they pass on this living faith to Timothy. They, they're passionate about, they have this passionate faith. Let's put on the screen 2 Timothy 3.15, quite a famous verse. Paul writes this later in the letter. And he says, and how from infancy, from the time you were infant, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So from the time that Timothy was an infant, his grandmother, his mother had made known the scriptures to him. Now, what does that mean, the Holy Scriptures? That means the Old Testament part of the Bible, the first part of the Bible. So even before they were introduced to Jesus, that Jesus even existed, they were already explaining to Timothy, to this young boy, that one day there would be a Savior, there would be an offspring of Eve that would come and rescue them and would come and set them free and to restore the world back to the way God had intended it from the very beginning. And so they were very passionate about their faith in God. They were faithful teachers and encouragers to Timothy. And why do I say that? Because in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 7, this is what it means to know the Holy Scriptures. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Lord says to Moses, tell the people to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then in verse 7 it says, impress them, these commands, on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. And I, it's very convincing that for Lois and Eunice, that's exactly what they had done for Timothy and in the life of Timothy. And so when the Apostle Paul shows up in their city and first to Lois, that is like, oh, okay, this is what we've been studying and, and, and thinking about our whole lives, and now we know who the Savior is. It's Jesus. And then for Eunice as well, it all made sense. And then for Timothy, he was probably about 15 years old when he first heard about Christ. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, it all makes sense. And so when Paul first meets Timothy in Acts chapter 16 that we looked at a few moments ago, Timothy is probably 14, 15 years old. He's already a disciple. But Paul saw the potential in Timothy. And Paul became Timothy's mentor. And Timothy, as a young man, became a pastor in the city of Ephesus. And now we're in 2 Timothy. As I said, Timothy's probably 34, 35 years old. A lot of time has gone by. He's been a pastor. Paul is now in prison. He knows this is one of his, Paul's one of his last letters he ever writes when he's alive. He knows he's about to die. And he is requesting Timothy to come to Rome. And Timothy is now going to take Paul's place to be the leader. And so we see this progression over 20, 22 years of this whole process. And so for Timothy's grandmother and mother, there's just been this consistent, they have just been consistent examples to Timothy, maybe more caught than taught, and sometimes that's the case. And so they would have shared the commands and the law of God, but just to be that consistent example in the life of this young man. And that's, that's what we do if we want to leave a legacy of our living faith to the next generation is this to be that consistent example. And sometimes it's not necessarily with a lot of words, it's just that, wow, whatever my mother has, whatever my grandmother has, whatever my great-grandmother has, it's real. It's the real thing. And they were willing to share this with me. Now, the third point, and then we'll be done, 
is a confident faith. So a mother's legacy is to pass on to future generations a living faith in Jesus Christ, which is a real faith, is a passionate faith, and finally, it is a confident faith. So Zeb read for us verse 12. So let's look at verse 12. Paul says, this is why I am suffering as I am. Because he says, I've been a teacher, I've, I've been uh, an apostle, I'm now in, in jail for, for this cause. He says, yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him against that day or until that day of his second coming. So Paul says, I know Christ, and because I know him, I have confidence in the promise of eternal life. It is that confident faith that Lois and Eunice and Timothy also experienced, that faith that is centered in Jesus Christ, faith that is based upon the truth of who Jesus is, that he is our Savior and he is our Lord. This week I've been thinking of a hymn that we have sung many, many times, and it goes like this. It says, I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And that's based on verse 12 of this passage. So our children desperately need a living faith that is real and that is passionate and that is confident. We can love and lead our children to Christ by allowing them to see Jesus in us and the hope that we have in Christ. My prayer is that our children will be devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Of all the children in our church, all the teenagers, that our children will become the men and women of God who will have this legacy that they will pass on of this living faith to their children and their children and their children and to all future generations. That is my prayer. Now, before we're done, I want to, four points of application. The first is this. There is no guarantee that if you say, okay, I want to leave this legacy that all of your children or all of your grandchildren or all of your great-grandchildren will necessarily have this living faith. Because many, many wonderful mothers who have had this living faith, one or more of their children or their grandchildren have never had this living faith in Christ. Because for each person, it is an individual decision. As Billy Graham always said, God doesn't have any grandchildren. It is something that each person in each generation must make that personal decision to follow Christ and to have that living faith. So it's an individual choice. So there is no necessarily any guarantee. Secondly, let me say, many mothers and many grandmothers and maybe great-grandmothers have never lived long enough to see their children have this living faith. But that does not mean that sometime after they went to heaven, that their children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren did not come to have this living faith. So if you're in that category today and say, well, I've been praying for my children, my grandchildren, or even my great-grandchildren, or all the above, and I haven't seen them having this living faith that you've been talking about this morning, keep praying. Because on many, many occasions, over the last 30 or 35 years, as I have talked to people here in this building or in various locations about Christ, so oftentimes in the conversation, it will come up that it's like, well, 
my mother might have mentioned something like this to me before, or my grandmother, because my mother was always praying for me, or my grandmother was always praying for me. And, oh, oh I always love to hear those words, because it's like, all right, there, God is going to be doing something very special in this person's life because there's a praying mother or a praying grandmother or a praying great-grandmother. Thirdly, I want to ask you this question as we begin to wrap up this morning. How many mothers, now this is what I've been pondering this week, how many mothers over many, many years, 155 years, have sat in this very room and they have seen their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren come to have a living faith in Jesus Christ? Would you say it would be the dozen, and, and, you know, dozen people, a dozen mothers? Would it be a hundred mothers? We don't know. Only eternity will ever reveal how many mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers have sat in this room, but they have passed their living faith onto their children and to future generations. So be encouraged by that. Just think of it. How many children have had this living faith because of their faithful mother or grandmother? Now, if you are here today and it's like, well, I'm not a mother, I'm not a father, I'm not a grandmother, I'm not a grandfather, I don't have any physical children, this doesn't apply to me, but it's not. Because one of the other places I was reading the Bible this week was in Romans chapter 16, verse 13, a verse that just popped out that seems like it was never there before. And the Apostle Paul is writing and he... Um, says hello to Rufus, and he says, and to your mother, who is like my mother. This woman was Paul's spiritual mother. You don't necessarily have to have physical children to have a legacy where you pass on your living faith to future generations. You can do that with or without physical children. So this message really is for everyone today. And so my final question is, have you left a legacy to future generations of this living faith in Jesus Christ? And if not, is that something you want to strive for? It's like, yes. There's not going to be any guarantee. I understand that. But to the best of my ability, I want to leave this legacy to future generations of this living faith that they would have this promise of eternal life that is only found in Jesus Christ. So there's a lot of things that are important that mothers need to do, and I understand that. But I think this is the most important. For every Christian mother, it's like, oh, yes, I want to leave that legacy. Let's take a moment to pray. Father God, we know that mothers have so many, many responsibilities. And Lord, today I do not want them to hear my words that this is just one more thing, another burden that has to be added to their list. But no, Lord, that this would be something that would be so exciting to them, of this hope, of this potential that not just for their children, but for their grandchildren and maybe great-grandchildren and for generations to come, that there would be this lasting legacy of sharing their living faith in Christ with the generations to come, that they would be able to experience the promise of life, not just physical life, but spiritual life, eternal life, this life of new quality, that even from the time of Adam and Eve, they dreamed about. And then this legacy was passed on from Adam and Eve to Seth, to Seth's son that had this living faith, and to Noah, and to Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and to Judah, and to David, and then ultimately to the Lord Jesus. And this legacy passes down to our own generation today that we need to pass it on to future generations that as many as possible would be able to experience this promise 
of eternal life. God, thank you that even though you have created, you created everything good, sin came into the world and messed up everything. But you are now in the process of restoring all things. And thank you, God, that you did not give up on the human race. You did not give up on us because you love us and you have shown your mercy and your grace to us and that you are even now restoring us as we are in your kingdom. So God, again, we worship you and we praise you. We thank you for all that you've done, all that you're doing in our lives and all that you will do until Jesus reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll ask you to stand as we close in worship song today. Oh, yeah. 
Seated. Let me share with you two announcements today. Next Sunday and the following Sunday, we're going to do the UBC Growth Track. So if you are looking for more information about our church, if you are looking uh, information about baptism or church membership or how to serve in the church, this is for you. So it's going to be for two weeks for May 16th and 23rd. And we'll be meeting at 11 o'clock right after the service starting next week and for the following week. Now, jumping ahead to Sunday, June 6th, uh, we are going to, after the service, we're going to have a special prayer time. We're calling Fueling God's Mission with Prayer from 11 to 12. So mark that on your calendar. That's a few weeks out, about a month away. And uh, we'll just stay, and as many of us want to stay, and we're just going to pray for our church and for the mission of our church. Uh, as we go into the summer months. So those are two special things that are coming up uh, in the coming weeks. So we're going to say farewell to our friends on Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us. Hope you have a great Mother's Day, and uh, hope you can join us again uh, next Sunday morning.